Chapter 4. Faith. Visualization and belief in attainment of desire. The second step toward riches. Faith is the head chemist of the mind. When faith is combined with the vibration of thought, the subconscious mind instantly picks up the vibration, translates it into its spiritual equivalent, and transmits it to infinite intelligence, as in the case of prayer. The emotions of faith, love, and sex are the most powerful of all the major positive emotions. When the three are combined, they have the effect of coloring the vibration of thought in such a way that it instantly reaches the subconscious mind, where it is changed into its spiritual equivalent, the only form that induces a response from infinite intelligence. Love and faith are psychic and are related to the spiritual side of man. Sex is purely biological and related only to the physical. The mixing or blending of these three emotions has the effect of opening a direct line of communication between the finite thinking mind of man and infinite intelligence. How to develop faith? There comes now a statement which will give a better understanding of the importance the principle of auto-suggestion assumes in the transmutation of desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. Namely, faith is a state of mind which may be induced or created by affirmation or repeated instructions to the subconscious mind through the principle of auto-suggestion. As an illustration, consider the purpose for which you are presumably reading this book. The object is naturally to acquire the ability to transmute the intangible thought impulse of desire into its physical counterpart, money. By following the instructions laid down in the chapters on auto-suggestion and the subconscious mind, as summarized in the chapter on auto-suggestion, you may convince the subconscious mind that you believe you will receive that for which you ask, and it will act upon that belief, which your subconscious mind passes back to you in the form of faith followed by definite plans for procuring that which you desire. The method by which one develops faith, where it does not already exist, is extremely difficult to describe, almost as difficult, in fact, as it would be to describe the color of red to a blind man who has never seen color and has nothing with which to compare what you describe to him. Faith is a state of mind which you may develop at will after you have mastered the 13 principles because it is a state of mind which develops voluntarily through application and use of these principles. Repetition of affirmation of orders to your subconscious mind is the only known method of voluntary development of the emotion of faith. Perhaps the meaning may be made clearer through the following explanation as to the way people sometimes become criminals. Stated in the words of a famous criminologist, when men first come into contact with crime, they abhor it. If they remain in contact with crime for a time, they become accustomed to it and endure it. If they remain in contact with it long enough, they finally embrace it and become influenced by it. This is the equivalent of saying that any impulse of thought which is repeatedly passed onto the subconscious mind is, finally, accepted and acted upon by the subconscious mind, which proceeds to translate that impulse into its physical equivalent by the most practical procedure available. In connection with this, consider again the statement, all thoughts which have been emotionalized, that is, given feeling, and mixed with faith, begin immediately to translate themselves into their physical equivalent or counterpart. The emotions, or the feeling portion of thoughts, are the factors which give thoughts vitality, life, and action. The emotions of faith, love, and sex, when mixed with any thought impulse, give it greater action than any of these emotions can do singly. Not only thought impulses which have been mixed with faith, but those which have been mixed with any of the positive emotions or any of the negative emotions may reach and influence the subconscious mind. From this statement, you will understand that the subconscious mind will translate into its physical equivalent, a thought impulse of a negative or destructive nature just as readily as it will act upon thought impulses of a positive or constructive nature. This accounts for the strange phenomenon which so many millions of people experience, referred to as misfortune or bad luck. There are millions of people who believe themselves doomed to poverty and failure because of some strange force over which they believe they have no control. They are the creators of their own misfortunes because of this negative belief 
which is picked up by the subconscious mind and translated into its physical equivalent. This is an appropriate place at which to suggest again that you may benefit by passing on to your subconscious mind any desire which you wish translated into its physical or monetary equivalent in a state of expectancy or belief that the transmutation will actually take place. Your belief or faith is the element which determines the action of your subconscious mind. There is nothing to hinder you from deceiving your subconscious mind when giving it instructions through autosuggestion, as I deceived my son's subconscious mind. To make this deceit more realistic, conduct yourself just as you would. If you were already in possession of the material thing which you are demanding when you call upon your subconscious mind, the subconscious mind will transmute into its physical equivalent, by the most direct and practical media available, any order which is given to it in a state of belief or faith that the order will be carried out. Surely, enough has been stated to give a starting point from which one may, through experiment and practice, acquire the ability to mix faith with any order given to the subconscious mind. Perfection will come through practice, it cannot come by merely reading instructions. If it be true that one may become a criminal by association with crime, and this is a known fact, it is equally true that one may develop faith by voluntarily suggesting to the subconscious mind that one has faith. The mind comes finally to take on the nature of the influences which dominate it. Understand this truth and you will know why it is essential for you to encourage the positive emotions as dominating forces of your mind, and discourage, and eliminate negative emotions. A mind dominated by positive emotions becomes a favorable abode for the state of mind known as faith. A mind so dominated may, at will, give the subconscious mind instructions, which it will accept and act upon immediately. Faith is a state of mind which may be induced by auto-suggestion, all down the ages, the religionists have admonished struggling humanity to have faith in this, that and the other dogma or creed, but they have failed to tell people how to have faith. They have not stated that faith is a state of mind and that it may be induced by self-suggestion. In language which any normal human being can understand, we will describe all that is known about the principle through which faith may be developed, where it does not already exist. Have faith in yourself have faith in the infinite. Before we begin, you should be reminded again that faith is the eternal elixir which gives life, power, and action to the impulse of thought. The foregoing sentence is worth reading a second time, and a third and a fourth. It is worth reading aloud. Faith is the starting point of all accumulation of riches. Faith is the basis of all miracles, and all mysteries which cannot be analyzed by the rules of science. Faith is the only known antidote for failure. Faith is the element, the chemical, which when mixed with prayer, gives one direct communication with infinite intelligence. Faith is the element which transforms the ordinary vibration of thought, created by the finite mind of man, into the spiritual equivalent. Faith is the only agency through which the cosmic force of infinite intelligence can be harnessed and used by humans. Every one of the foregoing statements is capable of proof. The proof is simple and easily demonstrated. It is wrapped up in the principle of auto-suggestion. Let us center our attention, therefore, upon the subject of self-suggestion and find out what it is and what it is capable of achieving. It is a well-known fact that one comes finally to believe whatever one repeats to oneself, whether the statement be true or false. If a person repeats a lie over and over, he will eventually accept the lie as truth. Moreover, she will believe it to be the truth. Every person is what he is because of the dominating thoughts which he permits to occupy his mind. Thoughts which a man deliberately places in his own mind and encourages with sympathy and with which he mixes any one or more of the emotions constitute the motivating forces which direct and control his every movement, act and deed comes now a very significant statement of truth. Thoughts which are mixed with any of the feelings of emotions constitute a magnetic force which attracts, from the vibrations of the ether, other similar or related thoughts. A thought thus magnetized with emotion may be compared to a seed which, when planted in fertile soil, germinates, grows, and multiplies itself over and over again. 
until that which was originally one small seed becomes countless millions of seeds of the same brand. The ether is a great cosmic mass of eternal forces of vibration. It is made up of both destructive vibrations and constructive vibrations. It carries, at all times, vibrations of fear, poverty, disease, failure, misery, and vibrations of prosperity, health, success, and happiness, just as surely as it carries the sound of hundreds of orchestrations of music and hundreds of human voices, all of which maintain their own individuality and means of identification through the medium of radio. From the great storehouse of the ether, the human mind is constantly attracting vibrations which harmonize with that which dominates the human mind. Any thought, idea, plan, or purpose which one holds in one's mind attracts from the vibrations of the ether, a host of its relatives, adds these relatives to its own force, and grows until it becomes the dominating, motivating master of the individual in whose mind it has been housed. Now let us go back to the starting point and become informed as to how the original seed of an idea, plan, or purpose may be planted in the mind. The information is easily conveyed. Any idea, plan, or purpose may be placed in the mind through repetition of thought. This is why you are asked to write out a statement of your major purpose or definite chief aim Commit it to memory and repeat it in audible words day after day until these vibrations of sound have reached your subconscious mind. We are what we are because of the vibrations of thought which we pick up and register through the stimuli of our daily environment. Resolve to throw off the influences of any unfortunate environment and to build your own life to order. Taking inventory of mental assets and liabilities you will discover that your greatest weakness is lack of self-confidence. This handicap can be surmounted, and timidity translated into courage, through the aid of the principle of autosuggestion. The application of this principle may be made through a simple arrangement of positive thought impulses stated in writing, memorized, and repeated, until they become a part of the working equipment of the subconscious faculty of your mind. Self-confidence formula. First, I know that I have the ability to achieve the object of my definite purpose in life. Therefore, I demand of myself persistent, continuous action toward its attainment, and I here and now promise to render such action. Second, I realize the dominating thoughts of my mind will eventually reproduce themselves in outward, physical action and gradually transform themselves into physical reality. Therefore, I will concentrate my thoughts for 30 minutes daily upon the task of thinking of the person I intend to become, thereby creating in my mind a clear mental picture of that person. Third, I know through the principle of auto-suggestion, any desire that I persistently hold in my mind will eventually seek expression through some practical means of attaining the object back of it. Therefore, I will devote 10 minutes daily to demanding of myself the development of self-confidence. Fourth, I have clearly written down a description of my definite chief AIM in life, and I will never stop trying until I shall have developed sufficient self-confidence for its attainment. Fifth, I fully realize that no wealth or position can long endure unless built upon truth and justice. Therefore, I will engage in no transaction which does not benefit all whom it affects. I will succeed by attracting to myself the forces I wish to use and the cooperation of other people. I will induce others to serve me because of my willingness to serve others. I will eliminate hatred, envy, jealousy, selfishness, and cynicism by developing love for all humanity because I know that a negative attitude toward others can never bring me success. I will cause others to believe in me because I will believe in them and in myself. I will sign my name to this formula, commit it to memory, and repeat it aloud once a day, with full faith that it will gradually influence my thoughts and actions so that I will become a self-reliant and successful person. Back of this formula is a law of nature which no one has yet been able to explain. It has baffled the scientists of all ages. The psychologists have named this law auto-suggestion and let it go at that. The name by which one calls this law is of little importance the important fact about it is, it works for the glory and success of mankind, 
if it is used constructively. On the other hand, if used destructively, it will destroy just as readily. In this statement may be found a very significant truth, namely, that those who go down in defeat and end their lives in poverty, misery, and distress do so because of negative application of the principle of auto-suggestion. The cause may be found in the fact that all impulses of thought have a tendency to clothe themselves in their physical equivalent. The subconscious mind, the chemical laboratory in which all thought impulses are combined and made ready for translation into physical reality, makes no distinction between constructive and destructive thought impulses. It works with the material we feed it through our thought impulses. The subconscious mind will translate into reality a thought driven by fear just as readily as it will translate into reality a thought driven by courage or faith. The pages of medical history are rich with illustrations of cases of suggestive suicide. A man may commit suicide through negative suggestion, just as effectively as by any other means. In a Midwestern city, a man by the name of Joseph Grant, a bank official borrowed a large sum of the bank's money without the consent of the directors. He lost the money through gambling. One afternoon, the bank examiner came and began to check the accounts. Grant left the bank, took a room in a local hotel, and when they found him, three days later, he was lying in bed, wailing and moaning, repeating over and over these words, my God, this will kill me. I cannot stand the disgrace. In a short time, he was dead. The doctors pronounced the case one of mental suicide. Just as electricity will turn the wheels of industry and render useful service if used constructively, or snuff out life if wrongly used, so will the law of auto-suggestion lead you to peace and prosperity, or down into the valley of misery, failure, and death, according to your degree of understanding and application of it. If you fill your mind with fear, doubt, and unbelief in your ability to connect with and use the forces of infinite intelligence, the law of auto-suggestion will take this spirit of unbelief and use it as a pattern by which your subconscious mind will translate it into its physical equivalent. This statement is as true as the statement that two and two are four. Like the wind which carries one ship east and another west, the law of auto-suggestion will lift you up or pull you down according to the way you set your sails of thought. The law of auto-suggestion, through which any person may rise to altitudes of achievement, which stagger the imagination, is well described in the following verse. If you think you are beaten, you are, if you think you dare not, you don't if you like to win, but you think you can't, it is almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost for out of the world we find. Success begins with the fellows will it's all in the state of mind. If you think you are outclassed, you are, you've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster person, but soon or late the person who wins is the one who thinks he can. Observe the words which have been emphasized, and you will catch the deep meaning which the poet had in mind. Somewhere in your makeup, perhaps in the cells of your brain, there lies sleeping, the seed of achievement which if aroused and put into action, would carry you to heights such as you may never have hoped to attain. Just as a master musician may cause the most beautiful strains of music to pour forth from the strings of a violin, so may you arouse the genius which lies asleep in your brain and cause it to drive you upward to whatever goal you may wish to achieve. Abraham Lincoln was a failure at everything he tried until he was well past the age of 40. He was a Mr. Nobody from nowhere until a great experience came into his life, aroused the sleeping genius within his heart and brain, and gave the world one of its really great men. That experience was mixed with the emotions of sorrow and love. It came to him through Anne Rutledge, the only woman whom he ever truly loved. It is a known fact that the emotion of love is closely akin to the state of mind known as faith. And it is for this reason that love comes very near to translating one's thought impulses into their spiritual equivalent. During his work of research, the author discovered from the analysis of the life work and achievements of hundreds of men of outstanding accomplishment that there was the influence of a woman's love at the back of nearly every one of them. Editor's Comment 
This statement is akin to the saying that behind every successful man there is a woman. The opposite is also true. The point here is that we cannot discount the power of love in propelling us to success. When you succeed, you do not only do so for yourself, you do also do so for the people you love, your family, your friends and community. End of editor's comment. The emotion of love in the human heart and brain creates a favorable field of magnetic attraction, which causes an influx of the higher and finer vibrations which are afloat in the ether. If you wish evidence of the power of faith, study the achievements of men and women who have employed it. At the head of the list comes the Nazarene. Christianity is one of the greatest single force of influence in the world. The basis of Christianity is faith no matter how many people may have perverted or misinterpreted the meaning of this great force, and no matter how many dogmas and creeds have been created in its name, which do not reflect its tenets. The sum and substance of the teachings and the achievements of Christ, which may have been interpreted as miracles, were nothing more nor less than faith. If there are any such phenomena as miracles, they are produced only through the state of mind known as faith. Some teachers of religion and many who call themselves Christians neither understand nor practice faith. Let us consider the power of faith as it was demonstrated by a man who is well known to all of civilization, Mahatma Gandhi of India. In this man, the world had one of the most astounding examples known to civilization of the possibilities of faith. Gandhi wielded more potential power than anyone that lived during his lifetime. And this, despite the fact that he had none of the orthodox tools of power, such as money, battleships, soldiers, and materials of warfare. Gandhi had no money, he had no home, he did not own a suit of clothes, but he did have power. How did he come by that power? He created it out of his understanding of the principle of faith and through his ability to transplant that faith into the minds of 200 million people. Gandhi has accomplished, through the influence of faith, that which the strongest military power on earth could not and never will accomplish through soldiers and military equipment. He has accomplished the astounding feat of influencing 200 million minds to coalesce and move in unison as a single mind. What other force on earth, except faith, could do as much? There will come a day when employees as well as employers will discover the possibilities of faith. That day is dawning. The whole world has had ample opportunity during the recent business depression to witness what the lack of faith will do to business. Surely, civilization has produced a sufficient number of intelligent human beings to make use of this great lesson which the depression has taught the world. During this depression, the world had evidence in abundance that widespread fear will paralyze the wheels of industry and business. Out of this experience will arise leaders in business and industry who will profit by the example which Gandhi has set for the world, and they will apply to business the same tactics which he has used in building the greatest following known in the history of the world. These leaders will come from the rank and file of the unknown workers who now labor in the steel plants, the coal mines, the automobile factories, and in the small towns and cities of America. Business is due for a reform, make no mistake about this. The methods of the past, based upon economic combinations of force and fear, will be supplanted by the better principles of faith and cooperation. Workers will receive more than daily wages. They will receive dividends from the business, the same as those who supply the capital for business. But first, they must give more to their employers and stop this bickering and bargaining by force at the expense of the public. They must earn the right to dividends. Moreover, and this is the most important thing of all, they will be led by leaders who will understand and apply the principles employed by Mahatma Gandhi. Only in this way may leaders get from their followers the spirit of full cooperation, which constitutes power in its highest and most enduring form. Editor's Comments The points of the preceding paragraph speak to the power of workplace collaboration. Collaboration is not just important for individuals, but also for businesses. Organizations must create an environment that allows for employee connection and collaboration. With the advent of the social technologies, we are beginning to see that even physical distance can be conquered by collaboration. 
Think of how many people now work from home as a result of the disruptions caused by the coronavirus pandemic. This is only possible because such technologies as Zoom, Jitsi, and WebEx are making it possible for people to collaborate within and across organizations. In the next decades, only the companies that master this process will lead the next economic revolution. End of editor's comments. This stupendous machine age in which we live, and from which we are just emerging, has taken the soul out of people. Its leaders have driven people as though they were pieces of cold machinery. They were forced to do so by the employees who have bargained, at the expense of all concerned, to get and not to give. The watchword of the future will be human happiness and contentment. And when this state of mind shall have been attained, the production will take care of itself, more effectively than anything that has ever been accomplished where people did not and could not mix faith and individual interest with their labor. Because of the need for faith and cooperation in operating business and industry, it will be both interesting and profitable to analyze an event which provides an excellent understanding of the method by which industrialists and entrepreneurs accumulate great fortunes by giving before they try to get. The event chosen for this illustration dates back to 1900, when the United States Steel Corporation was being formed. As you read the story, keep in mind these fundamental facts and you will understand how ideas have been converted into huge fortunes. First, the huge United States Steel Corporation was born in the mind of Charles M. Schwab in the form of an idea he created through his imagination. Second, he mixed faith with his idea. Third, he formulated a plan for the transformation of his idea into physical and financial reality. Fourth, he put his plan into action with his famous speech at the university club. Fifth, he applied and followed through on his plan with persistence and backed it with firm decision until it had been fully carried out. Sixth, he prepared the way for success by a burning desire for success. If you are one of those who have often wondered how great fortunes are accumulated, this story of the creation of the United States Steel Corporation will be enlightening. If you have any doubt that men can think and grow rich, this story should dispel that doubt, because you can plainly see in the story of the United States Steel, the application of a major portion of the 13 principles described in this book. This astounding description of the power of an idea was dramatically told by John Lowell in the New York World Telegram, with whose courtesy it is here reprinted. A pretty after-dinner speech for a billion dollars. When on the evening of December 12, 1900 some 80 of the nation's financial nobility gathered in the banquet hail of the University Club on Fifth Avenue to do honor to a young man from out of the West. Not half a dozen of the guests realized they were to witness the most significant episode in American industrial history. J. Edward Simmons and Charles Stuart Smith, their hearts full of gratitude for the lavish hospitality bestowed on them by Charles M. Schwab during a recent visit to Pittsburgh, had arranged the dinner to introduce the 38-year-old steel man to Eastern Banking Society. But they didn't expect him to stampede the convention. They warned him, in fact, that the bosoms within New York's stuffed shirts would not be responsive to oratory, and that if he didn't want to bore the Stiltons and Harrimans and Vanderbilts, he had better limit himself to 15 or 20 minutes of polite vaporings and let it go at that. Even John Pierpont Morgan, sitting on the right hand of Schwab as became his imperial dignity, intended to grace the banquet table with his presence only briefly. And so far as the press and public were concerned, the whole affair was of so little moment that no mention of it found its way into print the next day. So the two hosts and their distinguished guests ate their way through the usual seven or eight courses. There was little conversation, and what there was of it was restrained. Few of the bankers and brokers had met Schwab, whose career had flowered along the banks of the Monongahela, and none knew him well. But before the evening was over, they and with them Money Master Morgan were to be swept off their feet, and a billion-dollar baby, the United States Steel Corporation, was to be conceived. It is perhaps unfortunate, for the sake of history, that no record of Charlie Schwab's speech at the dinner ever was made. He repeated some parts of it at a later date during a similar meeting of Chicago bankers. 
and still later, when the government brought suit to dissolve the Steele Trust, he gave his own version from the witness stand of the remarks that stimulated Morgan into a frenzy of financial activity. It is probable, however, that it was a homely speech, somewhat ungrammatical, for the niceties of language never bothered Schwab, full of epigram and threaded with wit. But aside from that it had a galvanic force and effect upon the five billions of estimated capital that was represented by the diners. After it was over and the gathering was still under its spell, although Schwab had talked for 90 minutes, Morgan led the orator to a recessed window where dangling their legs from the high uncomfortable seat, they talked for an hour more. The magic of the Schwab personality had been turned on, full force, but what was more important and lasting was the full-fledged, clear-cut program he laid down for the aggrandizement of steel. Many other men had tried to interest Morgan in slapping together a steel trust after the pattern of the biscuit, wire and hoop, sugar, rubber, whiskey, oil or chewing gum combinations. John W. Gates, the gambler, had urged it, but Morgan distrusted him. The more boys, Bill and Jim, Chicago stock jobbers who had glued together a match trust and a cracker corporation, had urged it and failed. Albert H. Gary, the sanctimonious country lawyer, wanted to foster it, but he wasn't big enough to be impressive. Until Schwab's eloquence took J. P. Morgan to the heights from which he could visualize the solid results of the most daring financial undertaking ever conceived, the project was regarded as a delirious dream of easy money crackpots. The financial magnetism that began a generation ago to attract thousands of small and sometimes inefficiently managed companies into large and competition-crushing combinations had become operative in the steel world through the devices of that jovial business pirate, John W. Gates. Gates already had formed the American Steel and Wire Company out of a chain of small concerns, and together with Morgan had created the Federal Steel Company. The National Tube and American Bridge Companies were two more Morgan concerns, and the Moore brothers had forsaken the match and cookie business to form the American Group Tin Plate, Steel Hoop, Sheet Steel, and the National Steel Company. But by the side of Andrew Carnegie's gigantic vertical trust, a trust owned and operated by 53 partners, those other combinations were picayune. They might combine to their heart's content, but the whole lot of them couldn't make a dent in the Carnegie organization, and Morgan knew it. The eccentric old Scott knew it too. From the magnificent heights of Skibo Castle, he had viewed first with amusement and then with resentment, the attempts of Morgan's smaller companies to cut into his business. When the attempts became too bold, Carnegie's temper was translated into anger and retaliation. He decided to duplicate every mill owned by his rivals. Hitherto, he hadn't been interested in wire, pipe, hoops, or sheet. Instead, he was content to sell such companies the raw steel and let them work it into whatever shape they wanted. Now, with Schwab as his chief and able lieutenant, he planned to drive his enemies to the wall. So it was that in the speech of Charles M. Schwab, Morgan saw the answer to his problem of combination. A trust without Carnegie giant of them all would be no trust at all, a plum pudding, as one writer said, without the plums. Schwab's speech on the night of December 12, 1900, undoubtedly carried the inference, though not the pledge, that the vast Carnegie enterprise could be brought under the Morgan tent. He talked of the world future for steel, of reorganization for efficiency, of specialization, of the scrapping of unsuccessful mills and concentration of effort on the flourishing properties, of economies in the ore traffic, of economies in overhead and administrative departments, of capturing foreign markets. More than that, he told the buccaneers among them wherein lay the errors of their customary piracy. Their purposes, he inferred, had been to create monopolies, raise prices, and pay themselves fat dividends out of privilege. Schwab condemned the system in his hardiest manner. The short-sightedness of such a policy, he told his hearers, lay in the fact that it restricted the market in an era when everything cried for expansion. By cheapening the cost of steel, he argued, an ever-expanding market would be created. More uses for steel would be devised, and a goodly portion of the world trade could be captured. Actually, though he did not know it, Schwab was an apostle of modern mass production 
so the dinner at the university club came to an end. Morgan went home to think about Schwab's rosy predictions. Schwab went back to Pittsburgh to run the steel business for we Andrew Carnegie, while Gary and the rest went back to their stock tickers to fiddle around in anticipation of the next move. It was not long coming. It took Morgan about one week to digest the feast of reason Schwab had placed before him. When he had assured himself that no financial indigestion was to result, he sent for Schwab and found that young man rather coy. Mr. Carnegie, Schwab indicated, might not like it if he found his trusted company president had been flirting with the Emperor of Wall Street, the street upon which Carnegie was resolved never to tread. Then it was suggested by John W. Gates the go-between, that if Schwab happened to be in the Bellevue Hotel in Philadelphia, J.P. Morgan might also happen to be there. When Schwab arrived, however, Morgan was inconveniently ill at his New York home, and so, on the elder man's pressing invitation, Schwab went to New York and presented himself at the door of the financier's library. Now certain economic historians have professed the belief that from the beginning to the end of the drama, the stage was set by Andrew Carnegie, that the dinner to Schwab, the famous speech, the Sunday night conference between Schwab and the Money King, were events arranged by the canny Scott. The truth is exactly the opposite. When Schwab was called in to consummate the deal, he didn't even know whether the little boss, as Andrew was called, would so much as listen to an offer to sell, particularly to a group of men whom Andrew regarded as being endowed with something less than holiness. But Schwab did take into the conference with him, in his own handwriting, six sheets of copperplate figures, representing to his mind the physical worth and the potential earning capacity of every steel company he regarded as an essential star in the new metal firmament. Four men pondered over these figures all night. The chief, of course, was Morgan, steadfast in his belief in the divine right of money. With him was his aristocratic partner, Robert Bacon, a scholar and a gentleman. The third was John W. Gates, who Morgan scorned as a gambler and used as a tool. The fourth was Schwab, who knew more about the processes of making and selling steel than any whole group of men then living. Throughout that conference, the Pittsburghers' figures were never questioned. If he said a company was worth so much, then it was worth that much and no more. He was insistent, too upon including in the combination only those concerns he nominated. He had conceived a corporation in which there would be no duplication, not even to satisfy the greed of friends who wanted to unload their companies upon the broad Morgan shoulders. Thus he left out by design a number of the larger concerns upon which the walruses and carpenters of Wall Street had cast hungry eyes. When dawn came, Morgan rose and straightened his back. Only one question remained. Do you think you can persuade Andrew Carnegie to sell, he asked. I can try, said Schwab. If you can get him to sell, I will undertake the matter," said Morgan. So far so good. But would Carnegie sell? How much would he demand? Schwab thought about $320 million. What would he take payment in? Common or preferred stocks? Bonds? Cash? Nobody could raise a third of a billion dollars in cash. There was a golf game in January on the frost-cracking heath of the St. Andrews Links in Westchester with Andrew bundled up in sweaters against the cold, and Charlie talking volubly as usual to keep his spirits up. But no word of business was mentioned until the pair sat down in the cozy warmth of the Carnegie cottage hard by. Then, with the same persuasiveness that had hypnotized 80 millionaires at the university club, Schwab poured out the glittering promises of retirement and comfort, of untold millions to satisfy the old man's social caprices. Carnegie capitulated, wrote a figure on a slip of paper, handed it to Schwab and said, all right, that's what we'll sell for. The figure was approximately $400 million and was reached by taking the $320 million mentioned by Schwab as a basic figure and adding to it $80 million to represent the increased capital value over the previous two years. Later, on the deck of a transatlantic liner, the Scotsman said ruefully to Morgan, I wish I had asked you for $100 million more. If you had asked for it, you'd have gotten it," Morgan told him cheerfully. There was an uproar, of course. A British correspondent cabled that the foreign steel world was appalled by the gigantic combination. 
President Hadley of Yale, declared that unless trusts were regulated the country might expect an emperor in Washington within the next 25 years. But that able stock manipulator, Keen, went at his work of shoving the new stock at the public so vigorously that all the excess water, estimated by some at nearly $600 million, was absorbed in a twinkling. So Carnegie had his millions, and the Morgan Syndicate had $62 million for all its trouble, and all the boys, from Gates to Gary, had their millions. The 38-year-old Schwab had his reward. He was made president of the new corporation and remained in control until 1930. The dramatic story of big business, which you have just finished, was included in this book because it is a perfect illustration of the method by which desire can be transmuted into its physical equivalent. I imagine some readers will question the statement that a mere, intangible desire can be converted into its physical equivalent. Doubtless some will say, you cannot convert nothing into something. The answer is in the story of United States Steel. That giant organization was created in the mind of one man. The plan by which the organization was provided with the steel mills that gave it financial stability was created in the mind of the same man. His faith, his desire, his imagination, his persistence were the real ingredients that went into United States Steel. The steel mills and mechanical equipment acquired by the corporation, after it had been brought into legal existence, were incidental, but careful analysis will disclose the fact that the appraised value of the properties acquired by the corporation increased in value by an estimated $600 million by the mere transaction which consolidated them under one management. In other words, Charles M. Schwab's idea, plus the faith with which he conveyed it to the minds of J.P. Morgan and the others, was marketed for a profit of approximately $600 million. Not an insignificant sum for a single idea. What happened to some of the men who took their share of the millions of dollars of profit made by this transaction is a matter with which we are not now concerned. The important feature of the astounding achievement is that it serves as unquestionable evidence of the soundness of the philosophy described in this book, because this philosophy was the warp and the woof of the entire transaction. Moreover, the practicability of the philosophy has been established by the fact that the United States Steel Corporation prospered and became one of the richest and most powerful corporations in America, employing thousands of people, developing new uses for steel, and opening new markets, thus proving that the $600 million in profit which the Schwab idea produced was earned. Riches begin in the form of thought. The amount is limited only by the person in whose mind the thought is put into motion. Faith removes limitations. Remember this when you are ready to bargain with life for whatever it is that you ask as your price for having passed this way. Remember, also, that the man who created the United States Steel Corporation was practically unknown at the time. He was merely Andrew Carnegie's Man Friday, until he gave birth to his famous idea. After that he quickly rose to a position of power, fame, and riches. There are no limitations to the mind except those we acknowledge. Both poverty and riches are the offspring of thought. Chapter 5. Autosuggestion the medium for influencing the subconscious mind. The third step toward riches. Autosuggestion is a term which applies to autosuggestions and all self-administered stimuli which reach one's mind through the five senses. Stated in another way, autosuggestion is self-suggestion. It is the agency of communication between that part of the mind where conscious thought takes place and that which serves as the seat of action for the subconscious mind. Through the dominating thoughts which one permits to remain in the conscious mind, whether these thoughts be negative or positive, is immaterial. The principle of auto-suggestion voluntarily reaches the subconscious mind and influences it with these thoughts. No thought, whether it be negative or positive, can enter the subconscious mind without the aid of the principle of auto-suggestion, with the exception of thoughts picked up from the ether. Stated differently, all sense impressions which are perceived through the five senses are stopped by the conscious thinking mind and may be either passed on to the subconscious mind or rejected at will. The conscious faculty serves, therefore, as an outer guard to the approach of the subconscious. 
Nature has so built us that we has absolute control over the material which reaches our subconscious mind through our five senses. Although this is not meant to be construed as a statement that we always exercises this control. In the great majority of instances, we do not exercise it, which explains why so many people go through life in poverty. Recall what has been said about the subconscious mind resembling a fertile garden spot in which weeds will grow in abundance if the seeds of more desirable crops are not sown therein. Autosuggestion is the agency of control through which an individual may voluntarily feed his subconscious mind on thoughts of a creative nature, or by neglect, permit thoughts of a destructive nature to find their way into this rich garden of the mind. You were instructed, in the last of the six steps described in the chapter on desire, to read aloud twice daily the written statement of your desire for money, and to see and feel yourself already in possession of the money. By following these instructions, you communicate the object of your desire directly to your subconscious mind in a spirit of absolute faith. Through repetition of this procedure, you voluntarily create thought habits which are favorable to your efforts to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent. Go back to these six steps described in Chapter 2 and read them again, very carefully, before you proceed further. Then when you come to it, read very carefully the four instructions for the organization of your mastermind group, described in the chapter on organized planning. By comparing these two sets of instructions with that which has been stated on auto-suggestion, you, of course, will see that the instructions involve the application of the principle of auto-suggestion. Remember, therefore, when reading aloud the statement of your desire, through which you are endeavoring to develop a money consciousness, that the mere reading of the words is of no consequence unless you mix emotion or feeling with your words. If you repeat a million times the famous MLQA formula, day by day, in every way, I am getting better and better, without mixing emotion and faith with your words, you will experience no desirable results. Your subconscious mind recognizes and acts upon only thoughts which have been well mixed with emotion or feeling. This is a fact of such importance as to warrant repetition in practically every chapter, because the lack of understanding of this is the main reason the majority of people who try to apply the principle of auto-suggestion get no desirable results. Plain, unemotional words do not influence the subconscious mind. You will get no appreciable results until you learn to reach your subconscious mind with thoughts, or spoken words, which have been well emotionalized with belief. Do not become discouraged if you cannot control and direct your emotions the first time you try to do so. Remember, there is no such possibility as something for nothing. Ability to reach and influence your subconscious mind has its price, and you must pay that price. You cannot cheat, even if you desire to do so. The price of ability to influence your subconscious mind is everlasting persistence in applying the principles described here. You cannot develop the desired ability for a lower price. You, and you alone, must decide whether or not the reward for which you are striving, the money consciousness, is worth the price you must pay for it in effort. Wisdom and cleverness alone will not attract and retain money except in a few very rare instances where the law of averages favors the attraction of money through these sources. The method of attracting money described here does not depend upon the law of averages. Moreover, the method plays no favorites. It will work for one person as effectively as it will for another. Where failure is experienced, it is the individual, not the method, which has failed. If you try and fail, make another effort, and still another, until you succeed. Your ability to use the principle of auto-suggestion will depend, very largely, upon your capacity to concentrate upon a given desire until that desire becomes a burning obsession. When you begin to carry out the instructions in connection with the six steps, described in the second chapter, it will be necessary for you to make use of the principle of concentration. Let us here offer suggestions for the effective use of concentration. When you begin to carry out the first of the six steps, which instructs you to fix in your own mind the exact amount of money you desire, Hold your thoughts on that amount of money by concentration or fixation of attention with your eyes closed until you can actually see the physical appearance of the money. Do this at least once each day. As you go through these exercises, 
follow the instructions given in the chapter on faith, and see yourself actually in possession of the money. Here is a most significant fact. The subconscious mind takes any orders given it in a spirit of absolute faith, and acts upon those orders, although the orders often have to be presented over and over again through repetition, before they are interpreted by the subconscious mind. Following the preceding statement, consider the possibility of playing a perfectly legitimate trick on your subconscious mind by making it believe, because you believe it, that you must have the amount of money you are visualizing, that this money is already awaiting your claim, that the subconscious mind must hand over to you practical plans for acquiring the money which is yours. Hand over the thought suggested in the preceding paragraph to your imagination, and see what your imagination can or will do to create practical plans for the accumulation of money through transmutation of your desire. Do not wait for a definite plan, through which you intend to exchange services or merchandise in return for the money you are visualizing, but begin at once to see yourself in possession of the money, demanding and expecting meanwhile, that your subconscious mind will hand over the plan or plans you need. Be on the alert for these plans, and when they appear, put them into action immediately. When the plans appear, they will probably flash into your mind through the sixth sense, in the form of an inspiration. This inspiration may be considered a direct telegram or message from infinite intelligence. Treat it with respect and act upon it as soon as you receive it. Failure to do this will be fatal to your success. In the fourth of the six steps, you were instructed to create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once to put this plan into action. You should follow this instruction in the manner described in the preceding paragraph. Do not trust to your reason when creating your plan for accumulating money through the transmutation of desire. Your reason is faulty. Moreover, your reasoning faculty may be lazy, and if you depend entirely upon it to serve you, it may disappoint you when visualizing the money you intend to accumulate with closed eyes. See yourself rendering the service or delivering the merchandise you intend to give in return for this money. This is important. Summary of Instructions The fact that you are reading this book is an indication that you earnestly seek knowledge. It is also an indication that you are a student of this subject. If you are only a student, there is a chance that you may learn much that you did not know, but you will learn only by assuming an attitude of humility. If you choose to follow some of the instructions but neglect or refuse to follow others, you will fail. To get satisfactory results, you must follow all instructions in a spirit of faith. The instructions given in connection with the six steps in the second chapter will now be summarized and blended with the principles covered by this chapter, as follows. First, go into some quiet spot, preferably in bed at night, where you will not be disturbed or interrupted Close your eyes and repeat aloud, so you may hear your own words, the written statement of the amount of money you intend to accumulate, the time limit for its accumulation, and a description of the service or merchandise you intend to give in return for the money. As you carry out these instructions, see yourself already in possession of the money. For example, suppose that you intend to accumulate $50,000 by the 1st of January, five years hence, that you intend to give personal services in return for the money in the capacity of a salesman. Your written statement of your purpose should be similar to the following. By the first day of January, 2026, I will have in my possession $50,000, which will come to me in various amounts from time to time during the interim. In return for this money, I will give the most efficient service of which I am capable, rendering the fullest possible quantity and the best possible quality of service in the capacity of salesman. I believe that I will have this money in my possession. My faith is so strong that I can now see this money before my eyes. I can touch it with my hands. It is now awaiting transfer to me at the time and in the proportion that I deliver the service I intend to render in return for it. I am awaiting a plan by which to accumulate this money and I will follow that plan when it is received. Second. Repeat this program night and morning until you can see, in your imagination, the money you intend to accumulate. Third, place a written copy of your statement where you can see it night and morning and read it just before retiring and upon arising until it has been memorized. Remember, as you carry out these instructions, 
that you are applying the principle of auto-suggestion for the purpose of giving orders to your subconscious mind. Remember also that your subconscious mind will act only upon instructions which are emotionalized and handed over to it with feeling. Faith is the strongest and most productive of the emotions. Follow the instructions given in the chapter on faith. These instructions may, at first, seem abstract. Do not let this disturb you. Follow the instructions, no matter how abstract or impractical they may, at first, appear to be. The time will soon come, if you do as you have been instructed, in spirit as well as in act, when a whole new universe of power will unfold to you. Skepticism, in connection with all new ideas, is characteristic of all human beings. But if you follow the instructions outlined, your skepticism will soon be replaced by belief, and this, in turn, will soon become crystallized into absolute faith. Then you will have arrived at the point where you may truly say, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Many philosophers have made the statement that we are the master of our own earthly destiny, but most of them have failed to say why we are the master. The reason that we may be the master of our own earthly status and especially our financial status, is thoroughly explained in this chapter. We may become the master of ourselves and of our environment because we have the power to influence our own subconscious mind and through it gain the cooperation of infinite intelligence. You are now reading the chapter which represents the keystone to the arch of this philosophy. The instructions contained in this chapter must be understood and applied with persistence if you succeed in transmuting desire into money. The actual performance of transmuting desire into money involves the use of auto-suggestion as an agency by which one may reach and influence the subconscious mind. The other principles are simply tools with which to apply auto-suggestion. Keep this thought in mind, and you will, at all times, be conscious of the important part the principle of auto-suggestion is to play in your efforts to accumulate money through the methods described in this book. Carry out these instructions as though you were a small child. Inject into your efforts something of the faith of a child. The author has been most careful to see that no impractical instructions were included because of his sincere desire to be helpful. After you have read the entire book, come back to this chapter and follow in spirit and in action this instruction. Read the entire chapter aloud once every night until you become thoroughly convinced that the principle of auto-suggestion is sound, that it will accomplish for you all that has been claimed for it. As you read, underscore with a pencil every sentence, which impresses you favorably. Follow the foregoing instruction to the letter, and it will open the way for a complete understanding and mastery of the principles of success. Chapter 6. Specialized Knowledge. Personal Experiences or Observations. The fourth step toward riches. There are two kinds of knowledge. One is general, the other is specialized. General knowledge, no matter how great in quantity or variety it may be, is of but little use in the accumulation of money. The faculties of the great universities possess, in the aggregate, practically every form of general knowledge known to civilization. Most of the professors have but little or no money. They specialize on teaching knowledge but they do not specialize on the organization or the use of knowledge. Knowledge will not attract money unless it is organized and intelligently directed through practical plans of action to the definite end of accumulation of money. Lack of understanding of this fact has been the source of confusion to millions of people who falsely believe that knowledge is power. It is nothing of the sort. Knowledge is only potential power. It becomes power only when and if it is organized into definite plans of action and directed to a definite end. This missing link in all systems of education known to civilization today may be found in the failure of educational institutions to teach their students how to organize and use knowledge after they acquire it. Many people make the mistake of assuming that, because Henry Ford had but little schooling, he is not a man of education. Those who make this mistake do not know Henry Ford, nor do they understand the real meaning of the word educate. That word is derived from the Latin word educo, meaning to educe, to draw out, to develop from within. An educated person is not, 
necessarily, one who has an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. An educated person is one who has so developed the faculties of his mind that he may acquire anything he or she wants, or its equivalent, without violating the rights of others. Henry Ford comes well within the meaning of this definition. During the World War, a Chicago newspaper published certain editorials in which among other statements, Henry Ford was called an ignorant pacifist. Mr. Ford objected to the statements and brought suit against the paper for libeling him. When the suit was tried in the courts, the attorneys for the paper pleaded justification and placed Mr. Ford himself on the witness stand for the purpose of proving to the jury that he was ignorant. The attorneys asked Mr. Ford a great variety of questions, all of them intended to prove, by his own evidence, that while he might possess considerable specialized knowledge pertaining to the manufacture of automobiles, he was, in the main, ignorant. Mr. Ford was plied with such questions as the following. Who was Benedict Arnold? And how many soldiers did the British send over to America to put down the rebellion of 1776? In answer to the last question, Mr. Ford replied, I do not know the exact number of soldiers the British sent over, but I have heard that it was a considerably larger number than ever went back. Finally, Mr. Ford became tired of this line of questioning and in reply to a particularly offensive question, he leaned over, pointed his finger at the lawyer who had asked the question, and said, If I should really want to answer the foolish question you have just asked, or any of the other questions you have been asking me, let me remind you that I have a row of electric push buttons on my desk, and by pushing the right button, I can summon to my aid men who can answer any question I desire to ask concerning the business to which I am devoting most of my efforts. Now will you kindly tell me why I should clutter up my mind with general knowledge, for the purpose of being able to answer questions, when I have men around me who can supply any knowledge I require? There certainly was good logic to that reply. That answer floored the lawyer. Every person in the courtroom realized it was the answer not of an ignorant man, but of a man of education. Any person is educated who knows where to get knowledge when he or she needs it and how to organize that knowledge into definite plans of action. Through the assistance of his mastermind group, Henry Ford had at his command all the specialized knowledge he needed to enable him to become one of the wealthiest men in America. It was not essential that he have this knowledge in his own mind. Surely no person who has sufficient inclination and intelligence to read a book of this nature can possibly miss the significance of this illustration. Before you can be sure of your ability to transmute desire into its monetary equivalent, you will require specialized knowledge of the service, merchandise, or profession which you intend to offer in return for fortune. Perhaps you may need much more specialized knowledge than you have the ability or the inclination to acquire, and if this should be true, you may bridge your weakness through the aid of your mastermind group. Andrew Carnegie stated that he personally knew nothing about the technical end of the steel business. Moreover, he did not particularly care to know anything about it. The specialized knowledge which he required for the manufacture and marketing of steel, he found available through the individual units of his mastermind group. The accumulation of great fortunes calls for power, and power is acquired through highly organized and intelligently directed specialized knowledge, but that knowledge does not, necessarily, have to be in the possession of the person who accumulates the fortune. The preceding paragraph should give hope and encouragement to anyone with ambition to accumulate a fortune who has not possessed himself of the necessary education to supply such specialized knowledge as he may require. People sometimes go through life suffering from inferiority complexes because they are not people of education. The person who can organize and direct a master mind group of people who possess knowledge useful in the accumulation of money is just as much a person of education as any person in the group. Remember this if you suffer from a feeling of inferiority because your schooling has been limited. Thomas A. Edison had only three months of schooling during his entire life. He did not lack education, neither did he die poor. Henry Ford had less than a sixth grade schooling, but he has managed to do pretty well by himself financially. Specialized knowledge is among the most plentiful and the cheapest forms of service which may be had. 
If you doubt this, consult the payroll of any university. It pays to know how to purchase knowledge. First of all, decide the sort of specialized knowledge you require and the purpose for which it is needed. To a large extent your major purpose in life, the goal toward which you are working, will help determine what knowledge you need. With this question settled, your next move requires that you have accurate information concerning dependable sources of knowledge. The more important of these are, a. One's own experience and education. b. Experience and education available through cooperation of others, for example, Mastermind Alliance. c. Colleges and universities. d. Public libraries, through books and periodicals, in which may be found all the knowledge organized by civilization. e. Special training courses and certification. Editor's comments. If you are alive today, you are indeed very lucky. Never has it been so easy for people be able to learn. You too, and other learning platforms have revolutionized learning. There is no more excuse for ignorance. There is hardly any training you want that is not available in some form online. And importantly, they are often available for free. On the other hand, it is also easier to teach. People are developing learning courses from how to prepare local meals build computers to make a rocket. It is indeed a great time to be alive. Don't waste this opportunity. If you are listening to this book, congratulations, you have proven my point. End of editor's comments. As knowledge is acquired it must be organized and put into use, for a definite purpose, through practical plans. Knowledge has no value except that which can be gained from its application towards some worthy end. This is one reason why college degrees are not valued more highly. They represent nothing but miscellaneous knowledge. If you contemplate taking additional schooling, first determine the purpose for which you want the knowledge you are seeking, then learn where this particular sort of knowledge can be obtained from reliable sources. Successful people, in all callings, never stop acquiring specialized knowledge related to their major purpose, business, or profession. Those who are not successful usually make the mistake of believing that the knowledge acquiring period ends when one finishes school. The truth is that schooling does but little more than to put one in the way of learning how to acquire practical knowledge. With this changed world which began at the end of the economic collapse, came also astounding changes in educational requirements. The order of the day is specialization. This truth was emphasized by Robert P. Moore. Secretary of Appointments of Columbia University. Specialists most sought. Particularly sought after by employing companies are candidates who have specialized in some field. Business school graduates with training in accounting and statistics, engineers of all varieties. Journalists, architects, chemists, and also outstanding leaders and activity people of the senior class. The person who has been active on the campus whose personality is such that he or she gets along with all kinds of people, and who has done an adequate job with his studies has a most decided edge over the strictly academic student. Some of these, because of their all-around qualifications, have received several offers of positions, a few of them as many as six. In departing from the conception that the straightest student was invariably the one to get the choice of the better jobs, Mr. Moore said that most companies look not only to academic records, but to activity records and personalities of the students. One of the largest industrial companies, the leader in its field, in writing to Mr. Moore concerning prospective seniors at the college, said, We are interested primarily in finding people who can make exceptional progress in management work. For this reason we emphasize qualities of character, intelligence, and personality far more than specific educational background. Apprenticeship proposed. Proposing a system of apprenticing students in offices, stores, and industrial occupations during the summer vacation, Mr. Moore asserts that after the first two or three years of college, every student should be asked to choose a definite future course and to call a halt if he has been merely pleasantly drifting without purpose through an unspecialized academic curriculum. Colleges and universities must face the practical consideration that all professions and occupations now demand specialists 
he said, urging that educational institutions accept more direct responsibility for vocational guidance. One of the most reliable and practical sources of knowledge available to those who need specialized schooling is the night schools operated in most large cities. The correspondence schools give specialized training anywhere the U.S. males go, on all subjects that can be taught by the extension method. One advantage of home study training is the flexibility of the study program, which permits one to study during spare time. Another stupendous advantage of home study training if the school is carefully chosen, is the fact that most courses offered by home study schools carry with them generous privileges of consultation, which can be of priceless value to those needing specialized knowledge. No matter where you live, you can share the benefits. Anything acquired without effort and without cost is generally unappreciated, often discredited. Perhaps this is why we get so little from our marvelous opportunity in public schools. The self-discipline one receives from a definite program of specialized study makes up to some extent for the wasted opportunity when knowledge was available without cost. Correspondence schools are highly organized business institutions. Their tuition fees are so low that they are forced to insist upon prompt payments. Being asked to pay, whether the student makes good grades or not, has the effect of causing one to follow through with the course when you would otherwise drop it. The correspondence schools have not stressed this point sufficiently, for the truth is that their collection departments constitute the very finest sort of training on decision, promptness, action, and the habit of finishing that which one begins. I learned this from experience more than 25 years ago. I enrolled for a home study course in advertising. After completing eight or 10 lessons, I stopped studying, but the school did not stop sending me bills. Moreover, it insisted upon payment, whether I kept up my studies or not. I decided that if I had to pay for the course, which I had legally obligated myself to do, I should complete the lessons and get my money's worth. I felt, at the time, that the collection system of the school was somewhat too well organized, but I learned later in life that it was a valuable part of my training for which no charge had been made. Being forced to pay, I went ahead and completed the course, Later in life I discovered that the efficient collection system of that school had been worth much in the form of money earned, because of the training in advertising I had so reluctantly taken. We have in this country what is said to be the greatest public school system in the world. We have invested fabulous sums for fine buildings, we have provided convenient transportation for children living in the rural districts, so they may attend the best schools, but there is one astounding weakness to this marvelous system. It is free. One of the strange things about human beings is that they value only that which has a price. The free schools of America and the free public libraries do not impress people because they are free. This is the major reason why so many people find it necessary to acquire additional training after they quit school and go to work. It is also one of the major reasons why employers give greater consideration to employees who take home study courses they have learned, from experience, that any person who has the ambition to give up a part of his spare time to studying at home has in him those qualities, which make for leadership. This recognition is not a charitable gesture, it is sound business judgment upon the part of the employers. There is one weakness in people for which there is no remedy. It is the universal weakness of lack of ambition. Persons, especially salaried people, who schedule their spare time, to provide for home study, seldom remain at the bottom very long. Their action opens the way for the upward climb, removes many obstacles from their path, and gains the friendly interest of those who have the power to put them in the way of opportunity. The home study method of training is especially suited to the needs of employee people who find, after leaving school, that they must acquire additional specialized knowledge, but cannot spare the time to go back to school. The changed economic conditions prevailing since the Depression have made it necessary for thousands of people to find additional or new sources of income. For the majority of these, the solution to their problem may be found only by acquiring specialized knowledge. Many will be forced to change their occupations entirely. When a merchant finds that a certain line of merchandise is not selling, he usually supplants it with another that is in demand. The person whose business is that of marketing personal services 
must also be an efficient merchant. If his services do not bring adequate returns in one occupation, he must change to another, where broader opportunities are available. Stuart Austin Weir prepared himself as a construction engineer and followed this line of work until the Depression limited his market to where it did not give him the income he required. He took inventory of himself, decided to change his profession to law, went back to school and took special courses by which he prepared himself as a corporation lawyer. Despite the fact the Depression had not ended, he completed his training, passed the bar examination, and quickly built a lucrative law practice in Dallas, Texas. In fact, he is turning away clients. Just to keep the record straight, and to anticipate the alibis of those who will say, I couldn't go to school because I have a family to support, or I'm too old, I will add the information that Mr. Weir was past 40 and married when he went back to school. Moreover, by carefully selecting highly specialized courses in colleges best prepared to teach the subjects chosen, Mr. Weir completed in two years the work for which the majority of law students require four years. It pays to know how to purchase knowledge. The person who stops studying merely because he has finished school is forever hopelessly doomed to mediocrity, no matter what may be his calling. The way of success is the way of continuous pursuit of knowledge. Let us consider a specific instance. During the Depression a salesman in a grocery store found himself without a position. Having had some bookkeeping experience, he took a special course in accounting, familiarized himself with all the latest bookkeeping and office equipment, and went into business for himself. Starting with the grocer for whom he had formerly worked, he made contracts with more than 100 small merchants to keep their books at a very nominal monthly fee. His idea was so practical that he soon found it necessary to set up a portable office in a light delivery truck which he equipped with modern bookkeeping machinery. He now has a fleet of these bookkeeping offices, on wheels, and employs a large staff of assistants, thus providing small merchants with accounting service equal to the best that money can buy at very nominal cost. Specialized knowledge, plus imagination, were the ingredients that went into this unique and successful business. Last year, the owner of that business paid an income tax of almost 10 times as much as was paid by the merchant, for whom he worked when the Depression forced upon him a temporary adversity, which proved to be a blessing in disguise. The beginning of this successful business was an idea. Inasmuch as I had the privilege of supplying the unemployed salesman with that idea, I now assume the further privilege of suggesting another idea, which has within it the possibility of even greater income also the possibility of rendering useful service to thousands of people who badly need that service. The idea was suggested by the salesman who gave up selling and went into the business of keeping books on a wholesale basis. When the plan was suggested as a solution of his unemployment problem, he quickly exclaimed, I like the idea, but I would not know how to turn it into cash. In other words, he complained he would not know how to market his bookkeeping knowledge after he acquired it. So that brought up another problem which had to be solved. With the aid of a young woman typist, clever at hand lettering, and who could put the story together, a very attractive book was prepared, describing the advantages of the new system of bookkeeping. The pages were neatly typed and pasted in an ordinary scrapbook, which was used as a silent salesman with which the story of this new business was so effectively told that its owner soon had more accounts than he could handle. There are thousands of people, all over the country, who need the services of a merchandising specialist capable of preparing an attractive brief for use in marketing personal services. The aggregate annual income from such a service might easily exceed that received by the largest employment agency, and the benefits of the service might be made far greater to the purchaser than any to be obtained from an employment agency. The idea here described was born of necessity to bridge an emergency which had to be covered, but it did not stop by merely serving one person. The woman who created the idea has a keen imagination. She saw in her newly born brainchild the making of a new profession, one that is destined to render valuable service to thousands of people who need practical guidance in marketing personal services. Spurred to action by the instantaneous success of her first prepared plan to market personal services, 
This energetic woman turned next to the solution of a similar problem for her son who had just finished college, but had been totally unable to find a market for his services. The plan she originated for his use was the finest specimen of merchandising of personal services I have ever seen. When the plan book had been completed, it contained nearly 50 pages of beautifully typed, properly organized information, telling the story of her son's native ability, schooling, personal experiences, and a great variety of other information too extensive for description. The plan book also contained a complete description of the position her son desired, together with a marvelous word picture of the exact plan he would use in filling the position. The preparation of the plan book required several weeks' labor, during which time its creator sent her son to the public library almost daily, to procure data needed in selling his services to best advantage. She sent him also to all the competitors of his prospective employer and gathered from them vital information concerning their business methods, which was of great value in the formation of the plan he intended to use in filling the position he sought. When the plan had been finished, it contained more than half a dozen very fine suggestions for the use and benefit of the prospective employer. The suggestions were put into use by the company. One may be inclined to ask, why go to all this trouble to secure a job? The answer is straight to the point, also it is dramatic, because it deals with a subject which assumes the proportion of a tragedy with millions of men and women whose sole source of income is personal services. The answer is, doing a thing well never is trouble. The plan prepared by this woman for the benefit of her son helped him get the job for which he applied, at the first interview, at a salary fixed by himself. Moreover, and this too, is important, the position did not require the young man to start at the bottom. He began as a junior executive at an executive salary. Why go to all this trouble? Do you ask? Well, for one thing, the planned presentation of this young man's application for a position clipped off no less than 10 years of time he would have required to get to where he began, had he started at the bottom and worked his way up. This idea of starting at the bottom and working one's way up may appear to be sound. But the major objection to it is this. Too many of those who begin at the bottom never manage to lift their heads high enough to be seen by opportunity, so they remain at the bottom. It should be remembered also that the outlook from the bottom is not so very bright or encouraging. It has a tendency to kill off ambition. We call it getting into a rut, which means that we accept our fate because we form the habit of daily routine, a habit that finally becomes so strong we cease to try to throw it off. And that is another reason why it pays to start one or two steps above the bottom. By so doing one forms the habit of looking around, of observing how others get ahead, of seeing opportunity, and of embracing it without hesitation. Dan Halpin is a splendid example of what I mean. During his college days, he was manager of the famous 1930 National Championship Notre Dame football team when it was under the direction of the late Newt Rockne. Perhaps he was inspired by the great football coach to aim high and not mistake temporary defeat for failure, just as Andrew Carnegie, the great industrial leader, inspired his young business lieutenants to set high goals for themselves. At any rate, young Halpin finished college at a mighty unfavorable time, when the depression had made jobs scarce. After a fling at investment banking and motion pictures, he took the first opening with a potential future he could find selling electrical hearing aids on a commission basis. Anyone could start in that sort of job, and Halpin knew it, but it was enough to open the door of opportunity to him. For almost two years, he continued in a job not to his liking, and he would never have risen above that job if he had not done something about his dissatisfaction. He aimed, first, at the job of assistant sales manager of his company and dot the job. That one step upward placed him high enough above the crowd to enable him to see still greater opportunity. Also, it placed him where opportunity could see him. He made such a fine record-selling hearing aids that Mr. Andrews, chairman of the board of the Dictograph Products Company, a business competitor of the company for which Halpin worked, wanted to know something about that man Dan Halpin who was taking big sales away from the long-established Dictograph Company. He sent for Halpin. When the interview was over, Halpin was the new sales manager in charge of the Acoustican division. Then, to test young Halpin's mettle, 
Mr. Andrews went away to Florida for three months, leaving him to sink or swim in his new job. He did not sink. Newt Rockness' spirit of all the world loves a winner, and has no time for a loser inspired him to put so much into his job that he was recently elected vice president of the company and general manager of the Acoustican and Silent Radio Division, a job which most men would be proud to earn through 10 years of loyal effort. Halpin turned the trick in little more than six months. It is difficult to say whether Mr. Andrews or Mr. Halpin is more deserving of eulogy, for the reason that both showed evidence of having an abundance of that very rare quality known as imagination. Mr. Andrews deserves credit for seeing, in young Halpin, a go-getter of the highest order. Halpin deserves credit for refusing to compromise with life by accepting and keeping a job he did not want, and that is one of the major points I am trying to emphasize through this entire philosophy, that we rise to high positions or remain at the bottom because of conditions we can control if we desire to control them. I am also trying to emphasize another point, namely, that both success and failure are largely the results of habit. I have not the slightest doubt that Dan Halpin's close association with the greatest football coach America ever knew, planted in his mind the same brand of desire to excel which made the Notre Dame football team world famous. Truly, there is something to the idea that hero worship is helpful, provided one worships a winner. Halpin tells me that Rockne was one of the world's greatest leaders of men in all history. My belief in the theory that business associations are vital factors, both in failure and in success, was recently demonstrated when my son Blair was negotiating with Dan Halpin for a position. Mr. Halpin offered him a beginning salary of about one half what he could have gotten from a rival company. I brought parental pressure to bear and induced him to accept the place with Mr. Halpin, because I believe that close association with one who refuses to compromise with circumstances he does not like, is an asset that can never be measured in terms of money. The bottom is a monotonous, dreary, unprofitable place for any person. That is why I have taken the time to describe how lowly beginnings may be circumvented by proper planning. Also, that is why so much space has been devoted to a description of this new profession created by a woman who was inspired to do a fine job of planning because she wanted her son to have a favorable break. With the changed conditions ushered in by the world economic collapse, came also the need for newer and better ways of marketing personal services. It is hard to determine why someone had not previously discovered this stupendous need, in view of the fact that more money changes hands in return for personal services than for any other purpose. The sum paid out monthly, to people who work for wages and salaries, is so huge that it runs into hundreds of millions, and the annual distribution amounts to billions. Perhaps some will find, in the idea here briefly described, the nucleus of the riches they desire. Ideas with much less merit have been the seedlings from which great fortunes have grown. Woolworth's five and ten cent store idea, for example, had far less merit, but it piled up a fortune for its creator, those seeing opportunity lurking in this suggestion will find valuable aid in the chapter on organized planning. Incidentally, an efficient merchandiser of personal services would find a growing demand for his services wherever there are men and women who seek better markets for their services. By applying the mastermind principle, a few people with suitable talent could form an alliance and have a paying business very quickly. One would need to be a fair writer with a flair for advertising and selling, one handy at typing and hand lettering, and one should be a first-class business getter who would let the world know about the service. If one person possessed all these abilities, he might carry on the business alone until it outgrew him. The woman who prepared the personal service sales plan for her son now receives requests from all parts of the country for her cooperation in preparing similar plans for others who desire to market their personal services for more money. She has a staff of expert typists, artists, and writers who have the ability to dramatize the case history so effectively that one's personal services can be marketed for much more money than the prevailing wages for similar services. She is so confident of her ability that she accepts, as the major portion of her fee, a percentage of the increased pay she helps her clients to earn. It must not be supposed that her plan merely consists of clever salesmanship, 
by which she helps men and women to demand and receive more money for the same services they formerly sold for less pay. She looks after the interests of the purchaser, as well as the seller of personal services, and so prepares her plans that the employer receives full value for the additional money he or she pays. The method by which she accomplishes this astonishing result is a professional secret, which she discloses to no one excepting her own clients. If you have the imagination and seek a more profitable outlet for your personal services, this suggestion may be the stimulus for which you have been searching. The idea is capable of yielding an income far greater than that of the average doctor, lawyer, or engineer whose education required several years in college. The idea is saleable to those seeking new positions, in practically all positions calling for managerial or executive ability, and those desiring rearrangement of incomes in their present positions. There is no fixed price for sound ideas. Back of all ideas is specialized knowledge. Unfortunately, for those who do not find riches in abundance, specialized knowledge is more abundant and more easily acquired than ideas. Because of this very truth, there is a universal demand and an ever-increasing opportunity for the person capable of helping men and women to sell their personal services advantageously. Capability means imagination, the one quality needed to combine specialized knowledge with ideas, in the form of organized plans designed to yield riches. If you have imagination, this chapter may present you with an idea sufficient to serve as the beginning of the riches you desire. Remember, the idea is the main thing. Specialized knowledge may be found just around the corner, any corner. Chapter 7. Imagination, the workshop of the mind. The fifth step toward riches. The imagination is literally the workshop where all plans are created. The impulse, the desire is given shape, form, and action through the aid of the imaginative faculty of the mind. It has been said that we can create anything which we can imagine. Of all the ages of civilization, this is the most favorable for the development of the imagination, because it is an age of rapid change. On every hand, one may contact stimuli which develop the imagination. Through the aid of human imaginative faculty, we have discovered, and harnessed, more of nature's forces during the past 50 years than during the entire history of the human race previous to that time. We have conquered the air so completely that the birds are a poor match for him in flying. We have harnessed the ether and made it serve as a means of instantaneous communication with any part of the world. We have analyzed and weighed the sun at a distance of millions of miles and have determined, through the aid of imagination, the elements of which it consists. We have discovered that our brain is both a broadcasting and a receiving station for the vibration of thought, and we are beginning now to learn how to make practical use of this discovery. We have increased the speed of locomotion until we may now travel at a speed of more than 300 miles an hour. The time will soon come when a person may breakfast in New York and lunch in San Francisco. Our only limitation, within reason, lies in our development and use of our imagination. We have not yet reached the apex of development in the use of our imaginative faculty. We have merely discovered that we have an imagination and have commenced to use it in a very elementary way. Two forms of imagination. The imaginative faculty functions in two forms. One is known as synthetic imagination and the other as creative imagination. Synthetic imagination, through this faculty, one may arrange old concepts, ideas, or plans into new combinations. This faculty creates nothing. It merely works with the material of experience, education, and observation with which it is fed. It is the faculty used most by the inventor, with the exception of those who draws upon the creative imagination, when he cannot solve his problem through synthetic imagination. Creative Imagination through the faculty of creative imagination, the finite mind of man has direct communication with infinite intelligence. It is the faculty through which hunches and inspirations are received. It is by this faculty that all basic or new ideas are handed over to us. It is through this faculty that thought vibrations from the minds of others are received. It is through this faculty that one individual may tune in 
or communicate with the subconscious minds of other people. The creative imagination works automatically, in the manner described in subsequent pages. This faculty functions only when the conscious mind is vibrating at an exceedingly rapid rate, as for example, when the conscious mind is stimulated through the emotion of a strong desire. The creative faculty becomes more alert, more receptive to vibrations from the sources mentioned, in proportion to its development through use. This statement is significant. Ponder over it before passing on. Keep in mind as you follow these principles, that the entire story of how one may convert desire into money cannot be told in one statement. The story will be complete only when one has mastered, assimilated, and begun to make use of all the principles. The great leaders of business, industry, finance, and the great artists, musicians, poets, and writers became great because they developed the faculty of creative imagination both the synthetic and creative faculties of imagination become more alert with use, just as any muscle or organ of the body develops through use. Desire is only a thought, an impulse. It is nebulous and ephemeral. It is abstract and of no value until it has been transformed into its physical counterpart. While the synthetic imagination is the one which will be used most frequently in the process of transforming the impulse of desire into money, you must keep in mind the fact that you may face circumstances and situations which demand use of the creative imagination as well. Your imaginative faculty may have become weak through inaction. It can be revived and made alert through use. This faculty does not die, though it may become quiescent through lack of use. Center your attention, for the time being, on the development of the synthetic imagination because this is the faculty which you will use more often in the process of converting desire into money. Transformation of the intangible impulse of desire into the tangible reality of money calls for the use of a plan or plans. These plans must be formed with the aid of the imagination and mainly with the synthetic faculty. Read the entire book through, then come back to this chapter and begin at once to put your imagination to work on the building of a plan or plans for the transformation of your desire into money. Detailed instructions for the building of plans have been given in almost every chapter. Carry out the instructions best suited to your needs. Reduce your plan to writing if you have not already done so. The moment you complete this, you will have definitely given concrete form to the intangible desire. Read the preceding sentence once more. Read it aloud very slowly and as you do so, Remember that the moment you reduce the statement of your desire and a plan for its realization. Through writing, you have actually taken the first of a series of steps which will enable you to convert the thought into its physical counterpart. The earth on which you live, you, yourself, and every other material thing are the result of evolutionary change through which microscopic bits of matter have been organized and arranged in an orderly fashion. Moreover, and this statement is of stupendous importance, this earth, every one of the billions of individual cells of your body, and every atom of matter, began as an intangible form of energy. Desire is thought impulse. Thought impulses are forms of energy. When you begin with the thought impulse, desire, to accumulate money, you are drafting into your service the same stuff that nature used in creating this earth and every material form in the universe, including the body and brain in which the thought impulses function. As far as science has been able to determine, the entire universe consists of but two elements, matter and energy. Through the combination of energy and matter, has been created everything perceptible to humans, from the largest star which floats in the heavens, down to, and including humans themselves. You are now engaged in the task of trying to profit by nature's method. You are, sincerely and earnestly, we hope, trying to adapt yourself to nature's laws by endeavoring to convert desire into its physical or monetary equivalent. You can do it. It has been done before. You can build a fortune through the aid of laws which are immutable. But first, you must become familiar with these laws and learn to use them. Through repetition, and by approaching the description of these principles from every conceivable angle, the author hopes to reveal to you the secret through which every great fortune has been accumulated. Strange and paradoxical, as it may seem, 
the secret is not a secret. Nature herself advertises it in the earth on which we live, the stars, the planets suspended within our view, in the elements above and around us, in every blade of grass, and every form of life within our vision. Nature advertises this secret in the terms of biology, in the conversion of a tiny cell, so small that it may be lost on the point of a pin, into the human being now reading this line. The conversion of desire into its physical equivalent is, certainly, no more miraculous. Do not become discouraged if you do not fully comprehend all that has been stated. Unless you have long been a student of the mind, it is not to be expected that you will assimilate all that is in this chapter upon a first reading. But you will, in time, make good progress. The principles which follow will open the way for understanding of imagination. Assimilate that which you understand, as you read this philosophy for the first time. Then when you reread and study it, you will discover that something has happened to clarify it and give you a broader understanding of the whole. Above all, do not stop nor hesitate in your study of these principles until you have read the book at least three times, for then you will not want to stop. How to make practical use of imagination. Ideas are the beginning points of all fortunes. Ideas are products of the imagination. Let us examine a few well-known ideas which have yielded huge fortunes, with the hope that these illustrations will convey definite information concerning the method by which imagination may be used in accumulating riches. The Enchanted Kettle Fifty years ago, an old country doctor drove to town, hitched his horse, quietly slipped into a drug store by the back door, and began dickering with the young drug clerk. His mission was destined to yield great wealth to many people, it was destined to bring to the South the most far-flung benefit since the Civil War. For more than an hour, behind the prescription counter, the old doctor and the clerk talked in low tones. Then the doctor left. He went out to the buggy and brought back a large old-fashioned kettle, a big wooden paddle, used for stirring the contents of the kettle, and deposited them in the back of the store. The clerk inspected the kettle, reached into his inside pocket, took out a roll of bills, and handed it over to the doctor. The roll contained exactly $500, the clerk's entire savings. The doctor handed over a small slip of paper on which was written a secret formula. The words on that small slip of paper were worth the king's ransom, but not to the doctor. Those magic words were needed to start the kettle to boiling, but neither the doctor nor the young clerk knew what fabulous fortunes were destined to flow from that kettle. The old doctor was glad to sell the outfit for $500. The money would pay off his debts and give him freedom of mind. The clerk was taking a big chance by staking his entire life's savings on a mere scrap of paper and an old kettle. He never dreamed his investment would start a kettle to overflowing with gold that would surpass the miraculous performance of Aladdin's lamp. What the clerk really purchased was an idea, the old kettle and the wooden paddle, and the secret message on a slip of paper were incidental. The strange performance of that kettle began to take place after the new owner mixed with the secret instructions an ingredient of which the doctor knew nothing. Read this story carefully, give your imagination a test. See if you can discover what it was that the young man added to the secret message, which caused the kettle to overflow with gold. Remember, as you read, that this is not a story from Arabian Nights, here you have a story of facts, stranger than fiction facts which began in the form of an idea. Let us take a look at the vast fortunes of gold this idea has produced. It has paid, and still pays huge fortunes to men and women all over the world, who distribute the contents of the kettle to millions of people. The old kettle is now one of the world's largest consumers of sugar, thus providing jobs of a permanent nature to thousands of men and women engaged in growing sugarcane and in refining and marketing sugar. The old kettle consumes, annually, millions of glass bottles, providing jobs to huge numbers of glass workers. The old kettle gives employment to an army of clerks, stenographers, copywriters, and advertising experts throughout the nation. It has brought fame and fortune to scores of artists who have created magnificent pictures describing the product. The old kettle has converted a small southern city into the business capital of the South, where it now benefits, directly or indirectly, 
every business and practically every resident of the city. The influence of this idea now benefits every civilized country in the world, pouring out a continuous stream of gold to all who touch it. Gold from the kettle built and maintains one of the most prominent colleges of the South, where thousands of young people receive the training essential for success. The old kettle has done other marvelous things. All through the World Depression, when factories, banks, and business houses were folding up and quitting by the thousands, the owner of this enchanted kettle went marching on, giving continuous employment to an army of men and women all over the world, and paying out extra portions of gold to those who, long ago, had faith in the idea. If the product of that old brass kettle could talk, it would tell thrilling tales of romance in every language. Romances of love, romances of business, romances of professional men and women who are daily being stimulated by it. The author is sure of at least one such romance, for he was a part of it. And it all began not far from the very spot on which the drug clerk purchased the old kettle. It was here that the author met his wife, and it was she who first told him of the enchanted kettle. It was the product of that kettle they were drinking when he asked her to accept him, for better or worse. Now that you know the content of the enchanted kettle is a world-famous drink, it is fitting that the author confess that the home city of the drink supplied him with a wife. Also that the drink itself provides him with stimulation of thought without intoxication, and thereby it serves to give the refreshment of mind, which an author must have to do his best work. Whoever you are, wherever you may live, whatever occupation you may be engaged in, just remember in the future, every time you see the words Coca-Cola, that its vast empire of wealth and influence grew out of a single idea, and that the mysterious ingredient the drug clerk, a sack handler, mixed with the secret formula was. Imagination. Stop and think of that for a moment. Remember also that the 13 steps to riches described in this book were the media through which the influence of Coca-Cola has been extended to every city, town, village, and crossroads of the world, and that any idea you may create, as good and meritorious as Coca-Cola, has the possibility of duplicating the stupendous record of this worldwide thirst killer. Truly, thoughts are things, and their scope of operation is the world itself. What I would do if I had a million dollars? This story proves the truth of that old saying, where there's a will, there's a way. It was told to me by that beloved educator and clergyman, the late Frank W. Gonzalez, who began his preaching career in the Stockards region of South Chicago. While Dr. Gonzalez was going through college, he observed many defects in our educational system, defects which he believed he could correct, if he were the head of a college. His deepest desire was to become the directing head of an educational institution, in which young men and women would be taught to learn by doing. He made up his mind to organize a new college in which he could carry out his ideas, without being handicapped by orthodox methods of education. He needed a million dollars to put the project across. Where was he to lay his hands on so large a sum of money? That was the question that absorbed most of this ambitious young preacher's thought. But he couldn't seem to make any progress. Every night he took that thought to bed with him. He got up with it in the morning. He took it with him everywhere he went. He turned it over and over in his mind until it became a consuming obsession with him. A million dollars is a lot of money. He recognized that fact, but he also recognized the truth that the only limitation is that which one sets up in one's own mind. Being a philosopher as well as a preacher, Dr. Gunsellis recognized, as do all who succeed in life, that definiteness of purpose is the starting point from which one must begin. He recognized, too, that definiteness of purpose takes on animation, life, and power when backed by a burning desire to translate that purpose into its material equivalent. He knew all these great truths, yet he did not know where or how to lay his hands on a million dollars. The natural procedure would have been to give up and quit by saying, ah, well my idea is a good one, but I cannot do anything with it, because I never can procure the necessary million dollars. That is exactly what the majority of people would have said, but it is not what Dr. Gunsala said. What he said, and what he did are so important that I now introduce him, and let him speak for himself. 
One Saturday afternoon, I sat in my room thinking of ways and means of raising the money to carry out my plans. For nearly two years, I had been thinking, but I had done nothing but think. The time had come for action. I made up my mind, then and there, that I would get the necessary million dollars within a week. How? I was not concerned about that. The main thing of importance was the decision to get the money within a specified time, and I want to tell you that the moment I reached a definite decision to get the money within a specified time, a strange feeling of assurance came over me, such as I had never before experienced. Something inside me seemed to say, why didn't you reach that decision a long time ago? The money was waiting for you all the time. Things began to happen in a hurry. I called the newspapers and announced I would preach a sermon the following morning, entitled, What I Would Do If I Had a Million Dollars. I went to work on the sermon immediately, but I must tell you, frankly, the task was not difficult, because I had been preparing that sermon for almost two years. The spirit back of it was a part of me. Long before midnight, I had finished writing the sermon. I went to bed and slept with a feeling of confidence for I could see myself already in possession of the million dollars. Next morning I arose early, went into the bathroom, read the sermon, then knelt on my knees and asked that my sermon might come to the attention of someone who would supply the needed money. While I was praying I again had that feeling of assurance that the money would be forthcoming. In my excitement, I walked out without my sermon and did not discover the oversight until I was in my pulpit and about ready to begin delivering it. It was too late to go back for my notes, and what a blessing that I couldn't go back. Instead, my own subconscious mind yielded the material I needed. When I arose to begin my sermon, I closed my eyes and spoke with all my heart and soul of my dreams. I not only talked to my audience, but I fancy I talked also to God. I told what I would do with a million dollars if that amount were placed in my hands. I described the plan I had in mind for organizing a great educational institution, where young people would learn to do practical things and at the same time develop their minds. When I had finished and sat down, a man slowly arose from his seat, about three rows from the rear, and made his way toward the pulpit. I wondered what he was going to do. He came into the pulpit, extended his hand, and said, Reverend, I liked your sermon. I believe you can do everything you said you would, if you had a million dollars. To prove that I believe in you and your sermon, if you will come to my office tomorrow morning, I will give you the million dollars. My name is Philip D. Armour. Young Gonzales went to Mr. Armour's office and the million dollars was presented to him. With the money, he founded the Armour Institute of Technology. That is more money than the majority of preachers ever see in an entire lifetime. Yet the thought impulse back of the money was created in the young preacher's mind in a fraction of a minute. The necessary million dollars came as a result of an idea. Back of the idea was a desire which young Gunsilas had been nursing in his mind for almost two years. Observe this important fact. He got the money within 36 hours after he reached a definite decision in his own mind to get it, and decided upon a definite plan for getting it. There was nothing new or unique about young Gunsilas vague thinking about a million dollars and weakly hoping for it. Others before him, and many since his time, have had similar thoughts. But there was something very unique and different about the decision he reached on that memorable Saturday when he put vagueness into the background and definitely said, I will get that money within a week. God seems to throw himself on the side of the man who knows exactly what he wants if he is determined to get it. Moreover, the principle through which Dr. Gunsullis got his million dollars is still alive. It is available to you. This universal law is as workable today as it was when the young preacher made use of it so successfully. This book describes, step by step, the 13 elements of this great law and suggests how they may be put to use. Observe that a sack handler and Dr. Frank Gunsullis had one characteristic in common. Both knew the astounding truth that ideas can be transmuted into cash through the power of definite purpose plus definite plans. If you are one of those who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought. It is not true. Riches, when they come in huge quantities, are never the result of hard work. Riches come, if they come at all, 
in response to definite demands, based upon the application of definite principles and not by chance or luck. Generally speaking, an idea is an impulse of thought that impels action by an appeal to the imagination. All master salesmen know that ideas can be sold where merchandise cannot. Ordinary salesmen do not know this that is why they are ordinary. A publisher of books, which sell for a nickel, made a discovery that should be worth much to publishers generally. He learned that many people buy titles and not contents of books. By merely changing the name of one book that was not moving, his sales on that book jumped upward more than a million copies. The inside of the book was not changed in any way. He merely ripped off the cover bearing the title that did not sell and put on a new cover with a title that had box office value. That, as simple as it may seem, was an idea. It was imagination. There is no standard price on ideas. The creator of ideas makes his own price, and if he is smart, gets it. The moving picture industry created a whole flock of millionaires. Most of them were men who couldn't create ideas, but they had the imagination to recognize ideas when they saw them. The next flock of millionaires will grow out of the radio business, which is new and not overburdened with people of keen imagination. The money will be made by those who discover or create new and more meritorious radio programs and have the imagination to recognize merit and to give the radio listeners a chance to profit by it. The sponsor, that unfortunate victim who now pays the cost of all radio entertainment, soon will become idea conscious and demand something for his money. The person who beats the sponsor to the draw and supplies programs that render useful service is the person who will become rich in this new industry. Crew Nass and light chatter artists who now pollute the air with wisecracks and silly giggles will go the way of all light timbers and their places will be taken by real artists who interpret carefully planned programs which have been designed to service the minds of people as well as provide entertainment. Here is a wide open field of opportunity screaming its protest at the way it is being butchered because of lack of imagination and begging for rescue at any price. Above all, the thing that radio needs is new ideas. If this new field of opportunity intrigues you, perhaps you might profit by the suggestion that the successful radio programs of the future will give more attention to creating buyer audiences and less attention to listener audiences. Stated more plainly, the builder of radio programs who succeeds in the future must find practical ways to convert listeners into buyers. Moreover, the successful producer of radio programs in the future must key his features so that he can definitely show its effect upon the audience. Sponsors are becoming a bit weary of buying glib selling talks, based upon statements grabbed out of thin air. They want, and in the future will demand, indisputable proof that the Wusit program not only gives millions of people the silliest giggle ever, but that the silly giggler can sell merchandise. Another thing that might as well be understood by those who contemplate entering this new field of opportunity, radio advertising is going to be handled by an entirely new group of advertising experts, separate and distinct from the old-time newspaper and magazine advertising agency people. The old-timers in the advertising game cannot read the modern radio scripts because they have been schooled to see ideas. The new radio technique demands men who can interpret ideas from a written manuscript in terms of sound. It cost the author a year of hard labor and many thousands of dollars to learn this. Radio, right now, is about where the moving pictures were when Mary Pickford and her curls first appeared on the screen. There is plenty of room in radio for those who can produce or recognize ideas. If the foregoing comment on the opportunities of radio has not started your idea factory to work, you had better forget it. Your opportunity is in some other field. If the comment intrigued you in the slightest degree, then go further into it, and you may find the one idea you need to round out your career. Never let it discourage you if you have no experience in radio. Andrew Carnegie knew very little about making steel. I have Carnegie's own word for this, but he made practical use of two of the principles described in this book and made the steel business yield him a fortune. The story of practically every great fortune starts with the day when a creator of ideas and a seller of ideas got together and worked in harmony. 
Carnegie surrounded himself with people who could do all that he could not do. People who created ideas, and people who put ideas into operation, and made himself and the others fabulously rich. Millions of people go through life hoping for favorable breaks. Perhaps a favorable break can get one an opportunity, but the safest plan is not to depend upon luck. It was a favorable break that gave me the biggest opportunity of my life, but 25 years of determined effort had to be devoted to that opportunity before it became an asset. The break consisted of my good fortune in meeting and gaining the cooperation of Andrew Carnegie. On that occasion, Carnegie planted in my mind the idea of organizing the principles of achievement into a philosophy of success. Thousands of people have profited by the discoveries made in the 25 years of research, and several fortunes have been accumulated through the application of the philosophy. The beginning was simple. It was an idea which anyone might have developed. The favorable break came through Carnegie, but what about the determination, definiteness of purpose, and the desire to attain the goal, and the persistent effort of 25 years? It was no ordinary desire that survived disappointment, discouragement, temporary defeat, criticism, and the constant reminding of waste of time. It was a burning desire, an obsession. When the idea was first planted in my mind by Mr. Carnegie, it was coaxed, nursed, and enticed to remain alive. Gradually, the idea became a giant under its own power, and it coaxed, nursed, and drove me. Ideas are like that. First you give life and action and guidance to ideas, then they take on power of their own and sweep aside all opposition. Ideas are intangible forces, but they have more power than the physical brains that give birth to them. They have the power to live on, after the brain that creates them has returned to dust. For example, take the power of Christianity that began with a simple idea, born in the brain of Christ. Its chief tenet was, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Christ has gone back to the source from whence he came, but his idea goes marching on. Someday it may grow up and come into its own, then it will have fulfilled Christ's deepest desire. The idea has been developing only 2,000 years. If a time. Success requires no explanations, failure permits no alibis.